Pharisees were the strictest of the Jewish sects of the first century. If they so much as saw someone that they considered a sinner, they would turn and go the other way. It has become commonplace to take these people who were denounced by our Lord Jesus Christ as hypocrites and accuse those who oppose homosexuality of being Pharisees. The irony, of course, is that just the opposite for all the Pharisees' intolerance of other people's sins, they were very tolerant of their own. In the 18th chapter of Luke's Gospel, Jesus gives a parable to those who trusted that they were righteous and despised others. He said two men went to the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican, means a tax collector, a collaborator with Rome, a great sinner. Pharisee prays with himself, Jesus says, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I tithe of all that I possess. The publican dares not even raise his eyes to heaven. He beats on his breast and he cries out, God, be merciful. To me, a sinner. Jesus said that man went down to his house justified and not the other. Because everyone who exalts themselves shall be abased, and everyone who humbles himself shall be exalted. I am not here tonight as a self righteous Pharisee to denounce other people's sins, but I am here as a fellow sinner to plead with all of us to look at the Word of God and to see that we are all justly condemned by it. When we look in the mirror, we see that we are all rebels by nature against God. We are not good people, but there is a gospel, there is good news, that there is freedom and forgiveness to be found in Jesus Christ. The issue this evening is whether homosexual behavior is sinful and whether one can justly claim to know Jesus and continue to practice it. When God led Israel out of Egypt, he had them construct a tabernacle that would be there in the midst of the people, symbolizing his presence there. And he gave them the book of Leviticus to inform them how they are to behave themselves in the light of this new reality. The first seven chapters detail the sacrifices for sin, for thanksgiving, all the various sacrifices that could be offered in worship to God in that tabernacle. The next three chapters deal with the role of the priest. The next seven chapters deal with ritual purity of those that would go in and offer worship in that tabernacle. This is where you see some of the strange to modern ears stories of uh, becoming ritually unclean by touching a dead body and how you are to deal with all this because God is holy. And if you doubt that, read Leviticus 10 and see what they have a high received in not recognizing that God is holy. In Leviticus 18, the subject shifts to sexual morality because Israel is called to be a holy people. Over 400 years earlier, God had told Abraham that his descendants would have the promised land, but not for over 400 years, because he tells them the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. But now that time has passed. Now that iniquity is full, and God is leading the people of Israel into the land to execute his judgment. And he warns them in Leviticus 18, that there are sins that these people committed that are the basis of his judgment. And he warns them not to imitate these sins, lest he judge them as well. First, incest is forbidden. Parents are not to have sex with their children. Brothers and sisters are not to have sex with one another. There are a number of relationships in which sex is forbidden. You're not to have sex with your mother-in-law. 
You're not to have sex with your daughter-in-law, your stepmother. All these close relations, it is incest, and it is wrong in the sight of God. It is called an abomination. Adultery is forbidden. In verse 22, the Lord tells them, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast <coughs> to lie down there too. It is confusion. Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things. For in all these the nations are defiled which I cast out before you. And the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it. And the land itself vomited out her inhabitants. In verse 29, Israel is told, For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls that commit them shall be cut off from among the people. We're working out our technical problems. Uh, so this is the context. You notice nowhere in Leviticus 18 does it say anything about ritual purity, kosher foods, fabrics of mixed fibers. You find those things elsewhere in very, very different contexts. But in the beginning and at the end of what we designate Leviticus 18, there are bookmarks where we are told these are the sins for which the nations are being judged. And if you commit these things, you will be destroyed as well. Sodom had committed these same abominations and been destroyed by God. The Canaanites had committed them and were to be destroyed as well. If Israel tolerates these things, they will be destroyed. So in Leviticus 20, two chapters later, there are civil penalties for these sins. Incest, adultery, bestiality, homosexuality are all declared to carry a death sentence. In Leviticus 20.13 it reads, If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. The reaction of so many Americans in the 21st century say, well, that's the Old Testament. Not understanding how Jesus viewed the Old Testament. But did, do we find things changing in the New Testament? In 1 Corinthians 5, we have a man who has married his father's wife, something explicitly forbidden in Leviticus 18 and 20. It is not only forbidden, but it is considered to be a death sentence offense. But those, that was for the Jews. That, these are not Jews. These are Gentiles. That commonwealth has passed away along with the civil penalties. But what is the church to do? Is it to celebrate this? Is it to condone it? Paul tells the Corinthians, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, and that he and, and that hath done uh, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that hath done, so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit, which with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? There seems to be this idea in the church in Corinth that they're no longer under law, they're under grace. <laughs> that Israel and the civil penalties have passed away. So what's the big deal? Paul is horrified that they do not love this man enough to deal with his sin. They don't love the man, they don't love Christ's church. And Paul makes clear he is to be put out, he is to be excommunicated. So that he may repent and come back. Paul goes on to say, I wrote to you, unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners. He goes on. He says, But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, 
There's a difference for those who call themselves Christians. And that those who are living in rebellion to what God has prescribed, they are to be put out of the church. They're not to be received as brothers for their sake and for the sake of Christ's church. So let's be clear. Paul is calling them in the name of Jesus to exercise church discipline as Jesus himself prescribed in Matthew 18. It's in this context, just a couple of sentences later, that we come to one of the most famous passages dealing with homosexuality. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Paul says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves and of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Such things indicate that a person's heart has not been changed. They draw near to God with their lips, but their hearts are far from Him. The term translated into King James, abuses of themselves with mankind, is the Greek word arsenikoitai. It's literally a man who lies with or has sex with a man. When you go through Greek, you find that metrokoitai means man who has sex with his mother. Duokoitai, man who has sex with servants. Polykoitai, one who has sex with many. It's a term that does not occur prior to Paul, and yet we find that it's a direct quotation from Leviticus 20.13, from the Septuagint's translation from the Hebrew into the Greek, done about 200 years before Christ. The English renders it, if a man also lie with mankind as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. The first part there in the Greek is kai han koimethen meta arsenos koitein gunikos. If you didn't catch that in the middle there, you have arsenos koitein. What's the term that Paul's using? Arsenos koitein. <coughs> Same words. Remember that just a couple sentences earlier, Paul had told the church in Corinth to excommunicate a man over incest based on Leviticus 20.11 something written nearly one and a half millennia earlier. And he is now referring to this term used two verses later. Jesus came to save his people from their sins. He promises us a new heart. He promises to put his Holy Spirit within us, to change us. It is not sinful to be tempted by your father's wife. But it is sinful and the basis of excommunication, according to the Apostle of Christ, to give in to that temptation and to marry her. Even if this man wanted to identify himself as an incestuous Christian, Paul is clear, cast the evildoer out from among you. Paul is expanding on all that by saying that those who want to give themselves over to idolatry. They're not Christians. They're not to be deceived. They may think they are Christians. But they are not. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who want to give themselves over to covetousness, drunkenness, adultery, and homosexuality. The terms that are used there, malakoi and arsenokoitai, seem to be very clearly the active and passive partners in male homosexuality. These sins are forgivable, every one of them. And yet every one of them that is named there is inconsistent with a changed heart. And so if we cling to them, we are renouncing Christ. Paul is clear, such were some of you, not some, some, are, some of you are, these things. No, you are washed. You are sanctified. This is in the past. Homosexual behavior is specifically listed among the sins that were the basis of God's judgment of Sodom, 
Canaanites, and Israel. It carried the death sentence. Is it any surprise that a holy God says that it is the basis for excommunication from the church? And that it is something that is inconsistent with someone whose heart had really been changed. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, John says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Is homosexual behavior sin? Yes, it's condemned again. In Romans 1, 18. I'm running over on time here, so I won't read the whole passage, but basically, I understand. The the, the wrath of God has been revealed because people suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They corrupt the image of God. They try to make it into something pleasing to them, something manageable. And for this cause, God gives them over to vile affections. For even their women change the natural use into that which is against nature. Also, the men burn in their lust toward one another. These things are called dishonorable. Now please be clear, this is how the Gentiles saw, or rather the Jews saw the Gentiles, idolatrous and sexually immoral, given over to vile and dishonorable passions. And they were partly right. But as you read the rest of Romans, you find that they're condemned as well. In fact, by the time that you get to Romans 3.9, Paul draws a conclusion that we are all under sin. That the law has come that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. The world doesn't like to hear that. The world likes to say, thank you, God, for making me a righteous man. Look at all the things I do. The biblical response to what we see here is very different. The fundamental problem is not homosexuality. Adultery, incest, theft, or murder. It is prideful unbelief. It is idolatry. Trying to, sub, trying to submit God to our sinful desires. Trying to remake Him in our image. Rather than asking that He remake us according to His. Sometimes unbelief hides in religious trappings, as with the Pharisees. They were very religious people. They would pray day after day, year after year century after century for the coming of the Messiah. But when he came, he didn't meet their expectations. Because instead of dealing with everyone else's sins, he also dealt with theirs. And he called them to holiness. He called them to repentance. And so these very religious people, when confronted by not the Messiah of their dreams, but the real Messiah, they hated him. When Pilate asked what they would have him do with Jesus, they cried, crucify him. Let his blood be on us and on our children. Crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. When all this work was done, they went back praying for a Messiah who would meet their, their desires. But instead, 40 years later, Jesus, the Lord sent the Romans to destroy them. God's not mocked. Old Testament or New Testament. We all talk about Jesus, but what <coughs> Jesus are we following? Are we following the one in the Sermon on the Mount who said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name have many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Who is this Jesus who you think you know? And how are you coming to him? Are you coming to him saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner? Or are you coming to him as a Pharisee? 